you ever wonder why brutality in Vietnam gets so much bigger play than brutality by the Soviets in Afghanistan? Did you ever wonder why, uh, let's say, an uprising in Chile uh, would get reams more paper, uh, much uh, thicker uh, headlines than Cubans doing the unforgivable thing in a communist country of gathering on the street in front of an American thing down there, American interest section, or 10,000 Cubans in the Peruvian, how quickly they disappear from the headlines, how long a few Chileans who come out to testify about torture in Chile stay in the head, and so on and on and on and on. Well, for years, I thought, am I the only anti-communist paranoid left alive? And now I'm joined by the Spike. Ah, oh, the Spike. Robert Moss, my partner for the broadcast, is co-author of The Spike. It is a novel, but a lot of uh, true words are spoken through false teeth. Robert Moss is a journalist. You've seen his byline in The Economist. He's editor of Foreign Report. He's an expert on the Gulf. That means the Persian Gulf, the Middle East, and intelligence. Um, nowhere to begin. I'm so overwhelmed that somebody of stature has finally picked up a brick shaped like a book and tossed it through the stained glass window of the so-called Western Free Press. Where well, enough, the government does not print the papers, at least our government doesn't, but other governments have learned they can by sucking reporters up the exhaust pipe, by flattery, by playing on simple, but by plain old good old American style courthouse politics, you can arrange for the worst dictator in the world to get a very good press in America. When a dictator gets denuded, such as Fidel Castro back in April, May 1980, when Fidel Castro gets denuded, exposed as a dictator whose people will do anything to get out. When Castro is so exposed, there's always somebody in the Western press willing to hand him a bath towel and encourage people to look the other way. Here, Robert Moss, I kind of like what you're up to. Why don't you tell me how it all began for you? I gathered that, Barry. Well, it began, first of all, when Arno de Borgrau, the co-author, came to see me in London back in 1972. He was a worried man. He had exposed the head of the CLO network in Geneva, the Palestinian terrorist network in Geneva. His life was threatened. He had come to me because I'd just written a book on terrorism, was specializing in that subject, knew quite a lot about the PLO and didn't like what I knew. He wanted help and advice. We met at that stage, there was 20 years between us, but we became friends. And we found that our common concerns extended beyond worry about terrorism and the way that people legitimize and justify terrorists to the whole question of what was going wrong with what the public heard about the world. Because, you know, the public is the basis of any government's policy. If the public is not adequately informed about the facts of the real world, how can the government that it votes into power make the right decisions? And today, and over the last couple of years, as we have watched a lot of real estate changing hands, a lot of territory being occupied by the Soviets, and we watched the men of Moscow coming close to our reserves of oil in the Middle East, and other pieces of property we should be worried about, this question has become bigger in our minds, and I think perhaps in the minds of people in general. The question of, why were we surprised by these developments? Why were we so ill-prepared to cope with something like the invasion of Afghanistan? Why is the background so unknown to the man in the street? The answer rests with the media. Arno and I are journalists. This has been our career. We've spent between us about 45 years in this business of the media. Uh, we've been investigative reporters. We've worked in dangerous situations. My life has been threatened by the PLO, by the Iraqi Secret Service, by the IRA, by other uh, lunatic fringe groups. So we've run the risks. We've, we've been in the battlefield. But at the end of the day, one of the biggest battlefields we feel is the battle for the minds of the West, which is being waged in the media. Now, we've been worried about the things that you have expressed concern about in your very encouraging introduction. We've been worried, for example, about incidents like one that I'd like to tell you. Last year, a very prominent American journalist, a friend of mine, a man I liked, Larry Stern, National Affairs Editor of the Washington Post, died. And at his memorial service, a lot of people stood up and made speeches. And they were very nice speeches, as you would expect for a prominent American journalist. One of the people who made the speech was a Cuban. His name was Teofilo Acosta Rodriguez. 
He made a speech, he said, Larry had been a wonderful journalist, a good friend of Cuba, and so on. He sat down, congratulated, handshakes all round. Who was Teofilo Acosta? Teofilo Acosta's nominal job is first secretary in what was then the Cuban interest section at the Czech embassy. His real job is station chief of Castro's secret service, the DGI, in Washington. Now, that doesn't prove anything about the man he was praising, one way or the other. I wouldn't suggest for a moment that Larry Stone was anything other than an honest American journalist. But what scandalized me, and I think should cause public concern, is that here we have the intelligence chief, the spy chief of a hostile power, praising an American journalist, expressing close intimacy with the American media. And there's not a peep of protest, not an expression of concern. Imagine. Was that printed in the Washington Post? That was not printed in the Washington Post was not even mentioned, so the public doesn't know what's going on, once again. Imagine if the head of a foreign pro-Western intelligence service had an ovation these days, at any occasion, in honor of a prominent journalist. Wouldn't there be uproar, people talking about media manipulation, have the CIA got their hands on our minds, uh, is Britain or Israel or some other allied country intervening in American politics? People would be concerned, and they might be right to be concerned, because we should worry about people who try to steal our minds and shape our actions. In this case, when the intelligence chief of a communist hostile power shows that he's trying to work the media in this country, trying to pull strings and influence American public opinion, nobody seems to care. It's not reported in the media. There's no scandal. The fact that there's one big area that the media in the United States has been systematically overlooking for a long time now. That is the covert involvement of the Soviets and their friends in our domestic affairs. The KGB, the Soviet Secret Service, is not under investigation in this country. We've had countless cover stories on the CIA. We don't get cover stories on the KGB. It's not under investigation. Yet the KGB is the most ruthless and the largest secret service in the world, various departments. One of its departments is called Directorate A. This figures very much in our novel, The Spike. Directorate A is the department responsible for what the Russians call disinformation. That's a Russian word originally. When in fact the Poles thought of it, the Poles think of most good things that turn out to be Russian later on. <laughs> but uh, the word was originally desinformatia, disinformation. It's a word that is unfamiliar to most people today, but it's a word that is absolutely central to the thinking of these Russians. He wished to rededicate The Spike to every honest, pro-freedom, anti-communist, anti-Nazi who rejoiced when Nazism was defeated and then took a breath and looked around disappointed when the communists sort of took the place of the Nazis in many key respects, conquering countries and stuff, and has ever since tried to rally free nations, free people, free minds, tried to pinpoint the encroaching, uh, increasing uh, engulfment uh, by communists of neighboring nations. And what did he get for it? Bony fingers of indignation calling him a running dog of the McCarthyite Cold War hysterical maniac Wall Street witch hunters. Why? Easily the mindset. The poison gas in the air conditioning system, the lens that we are given with which to view the world has been stacked. It has been gimmicked. At last, here comes an authority, not just a shrill broadcaster with a southern accent, but a journalist and editor with a British accent. That's much more convincing when it comes to <laughs> anybody with my accent. They assume it's a sharecropper or a sportscaster or a sheriff. You understand what I mean? Maybe in the good ringing tones of Robert Moss, the message from inside his book, The Spike, uh, will waft forth across the land. It is a fraud, folks. It's a fraud. The game is Fixed, the deck is stacked, the wheel is gimmicked. You know, one of the things that taught me about the Soviets, and therefore about the risks that we run today in the world, the threat that they pose to us, was when one day in 1974, at a weekend, I went, I suppose illegally, into your Pentagon in Washington. And I looked at a lot of surveillance pictures of what the Soviets were doing with their defense buildup. And one of those pictures, Barry, showed me that they were burying grain, burying the grain they have to import from the West because their agriculture is so inefficient they can't produce it for themselves. They were burying this grain imported from us in underground silos, three times the size of a football field, near places like Kharkov 
There are about three of these gigantic wheat silos, grain silos, three times the size of a football field, buried under reinforced surfaces, as hard as what we use to protect our missiles. Now, I saw pictures like that, and I said to myself, why does any country that can't feed its own people bury food in these quantities? There's only one explanation. That country means business. It means to go to war. It means at least to have the capacity to go to war. And if we don't understand that, we're in trouble. And the problem has been we haven't been told, as Western societies, enough about it. The public has not been told. Children so ugly only a mother could love. Uh, did you see pictures of the roads in the far north leading directly into Norway uh, and Sweden and Finland? Uh, roads that only a general could love? Certainly. They're not for reindeer crossings. They're not for reindeer crossings. How about these chemicals and these germ weapons that the Russians are producing? Now, we think that we've done some horrible things in the West. I mean, we put napalm in Vietnam. We've done other things that are nasty. Certainly. Certainly we've done nasty things. But we haven't equipped about a third of our artillery and a third to a half of our missiles with chemical warheads and warheads containing the nastiest, creepiest bacterial, bacteriological agents you could imagine. This is a very good way of killing people if you want to take over their country. It's a perfect capitalist weapon. Things like nerve gas. You can wipe out of the population of the country and walk in and occupy it a few weeks later. This is what the Russians have been doing. But again, the media hasn't been telling the people in the United States and other Western countries. Think how much we've heard about Three Mile Island and the catastrophe there in which no one died and no one was hospitalized. I'm not saying I'm not concerned about safety of nuclear power plants. Everybody should be. But no, last no. year, we had a germ warfare accident in Russia. According to emigres who reached Israel, this killed up to a thousand people. They died because a nasty bacteria was let loose accidentally in the Sverdlovsk region. About a thousand people died. Now, that's a major disaster for the Russians. But it's a disaster for us. We should be told about and absorbed because it means they are mass-producing these horrific things. And again, they mean to use them. I, I was the first journalist to break that story, by the way. But it took about two months before it reached the pages of your know, major East Coast newspaper. And it never really made the newspapers. Some things make the newspapers, and other things make the newspapers. You don't have Soviet-style complete blackout of stories they don't like in America. But by sensing a story to Siberia, you know, page 189 under the shipping notices, we get a mindset. If it's not on page one, two, or three, then it's there to support advertisements of a sheet sale. One of our problems in coping with all of this is lack of imagination. It's very difficult to put yourself into the mind of somebody who is totally alien to your own experience. Somebody of a different culture, different language, different mindset, different political system. Hold on, I'm having an out-of-body experience right now, which I'll get to a little bit later on. I cannot believe that this is not a, a McCarthyite kind of thing. I can't. I, I can imagine me saying, "Look, the media really is stacked uh, in favor of the left," and then getting ashtrays thrown by angry members of the faculty. What a delight to have Robert Moss, major editor and author, expert on terrorism, communism, the Gulf and foreign intelligence come to these microphones with a major blistering bestseller. You know, you may have all those left-wing actresses competing to play the lead in the fight. <laughs> That'll be my definition of victory. That's my arch de triomphe. <laughs> well, you know, Barry, the British have to be very careful about how they talk to Americans, although I find that there's a certain mood of support for the British coming back in this country. I stood up at a speech recently, and at the outset I said, look, I have a business venture. Would somebody back it? I want to mass-produce a T-shirt showing the portrait of King George III, with the inscription, now more than ever. <laughs> Somebody jumped up in the front row with a hundred dollar bill and he said, you're on. <laughs> the mentality of a different culture. I think it's an almost impossible task. Uh, people who live very close to problems with alien hostile cultures can do it much more easily than, than those who live further away. The Israelis, for example, can put themselves in the minds of the Palestinians because they're fighting them. They know their mindset. And in the minds of the Russians, and so many of them came from Russia. For Americans living far away from the front line, so to speak, although in fact everywhere is the front line today, we live in a small world, it is hard. So what do we get when the Soviets commit some act of aggression? Let's take Afghanistan. We're all aware that something has gone awfully wrong in Afghanistan. We have a lot of people getting up in the media and in politics to tell us to go back to sleep. 
is not that bad. You know, the Russians are on the defensive, aren't they? They're worried about an unstable border. They're worried about the possibility that Muslims revolting in Afghanistan will create Muslim revolt in the Soviet Union. There was a big debate in the Kremlin, we're told, and there are doves in the Kremlin like there are in Washington and all the rest of it. Now, this is the most incredible nonsense because we don't know what is going on in Moscow in great detail because, unfortunately, our intelligence has been so weak and we don't have the sources that we need in Moscow to tell us. But we can be sure of one thing. The men in Moscow have been around for a long time. They are the leaders, the dictators of a totalitarian regime that are not subject to any of the controls that our governments are subject to. They're not subject to scrutiny by the press. They're not subject to criticism from Congress. They're not subject to any of the checks and balances that our governments have to observe and respect. And, as I say, they've been around for an awfully long time. They, by and large, they know what they're doing. The men who... Uh, have been lying to the United States government over the Afghan crisis and so on, coming from Moscow to lie to the Americans about what their intentions are, are the same men who are lying to John F. Kennedy in 1962. Grimico, who lied to Kennedy about the missiles in Cuba, is still telling lies to the West today. Now, the important thing to remember is that this closed, aging regime has this long-term view. We can be sure that the Soviets are bent on doing what they say. And I'll give you a more secret example of what the Soviets intend to do. In August 1973, Leonid Brezhnev, the Soviet president, the head of this to totalitarian empire, spoke to a closed meeting of Warsaw Pact leaders in Prague. All the leaders of Eastern Europe were there. And I can tell you what he said because two Western agents were present. One of them was British. So there was a report. And at this closed meeting of Warsaw Pact leaders, President Brezhnev, as he later became, said the following thing. By the year 1985, he said, we, the Soviets, will be in a position to impose our will, to impose our will with impunity over Western Europe and in other areas of interest. Now, I don't know how you interpret a remark like that, given in a closed situation to his henchmen and cronies from Eastern Europe, but I interpret it as what it seems to be, as a deadline for world domination by the Soviets. But unfortunately, in the West, there are a lot of people, not just uninformed people either, but informed people, journalists, politicians, who seem to think that this barbaric but very shrewd totalitarian regime is made up of men who share our hopes and fears instead of thinking totally differently. I'm afraid this is not so. But every time we get something like the invasion of Afghanistan, we get all these people who stand up and say, oh, let's go back to sleep. It can't be that bad. The Soviets can't be bent on dominating us. It's defensive. There are hawks and doves. We mustn't react because we would strengthen these hawks in Moscow. Mm -hmm. And you know, I once said to a senator in the United States who was giving me this spiel, hawks and doves, don't react to the Soviets because you'll strengthen the Soviet hawks. They're just like our Pentagon hawks. We want to have the doves on both sides supporting each other. I said to him, Senator, I respect your views. You're a distinguished man. You have experience of the world. But could you please identify by name these hawks and these doves in Moscow? He said, oh, Mr. Moss, he said, I wouldn't want to get into personalities. So I said, well, Senator, could you at least give me some cases, some examples of Soviet moderation in recent years that would show that these doves in Moscow were of assistance to us? He said, well, really, I can't go through it now, but all I would say is, if these hawks in Moscow get any stronger, we'll be in a, a far worse situation. Now, this is an example of what I think of as mirror image thinking. We cover it a lot in this novel, The Spike. Mirror image thinking. In other words, we can't put ourselves into the brains of a totalitarian dictatorship and understand it. We have to transfer our own mindset, our own pattern of thinking to them, and pretend to ourselves, and it gives us comfort and makes us sleep easier at night, but they're like us. They are not like us. They have different ambitions, and they're frightening ambitions. The Western disbelief that the Russians can possibly be, or, I mean, weren't they our great wartime ally? Didn't we support them? Aren't they grateful? Well, let's, call, let's look at that. I mean, the history is sometimes important and sometimes more relevant than people imagine. Our great wartime ally, let's not forget the Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact. 
Let's not forget that in Poland, that in Poland, Soviet KGB agents were sent in, parachuted in during the war, whose specific written instructions were to betray to the Gestapo the authentic Polish resistance movements, so that there would be no non-communist resistance in Poland after the Nazis were finally defeated. Let's not forget that the Soviets, even when we thought they were our wartime allies, were still at some levels collaborating with the Nazis. Let's not forget either that many Nazis survived in communist systems. The Secret Service of East Germany, which is very active in the world today, backing terrorism, training security services for new Marxist dictatorships in Africa. But the East German Security Service, the MFS, contains many former high officials of the Gestapo and the SS. So the Nazis and the Soviets aren't necessarily totally different. The necessity it is that we here in England are digging slit trenches and trying on gas masks because of a quarrel in a faraway country among people about whom we know nothing. Well, Barry, that's very true. I mean, we've had appeasement in Britain, but let's remind you one thing. It's not a known fact to most people, but it's an interesting one. Between 1936 and 1939, the three years before World War II, the men who gave us Munich, the men with the umbrellas, the men we called the appeasers, who were prepared to forgive Hitler for many things, these people, these people increased the defense spending of Britain by 250% in real terms in three years. Now, what do we have today? We have maybe 3%, 4%, the figures are always being debated, increases in defense spending. Really, the West is doing very little to balance the Soviet military buildup, and we have the latest CIA estimates which say that the Russians are spending 50% more on defense than the United States, 80% more on procurement of new hardware, and that they are spending so much more on, on research and development that it's a factor of 2.6 to 1. In other words, they're outspending the United States in every category of defense spending, and they're getting value for money. So we have appeasement today. We have people who are prepared to give you the equivalent of the Munich agreement between the British and the Germans, 1938. We have people who are ready to appease. But the British appeasers were better. They spent more on defense while they were appeasing. At least they were preparing the basis for fighting a war. Mm -hmm. Uh, I heard a revisionist historian uh, praise Chamberlain as being as important to the winning of World War II as Winston Churchill, because although he appeared to be the sissy in the umbrella giving Europe to Hitler, he was buying time because he knew how unprepared the British were. Well, I'm not as charitable to Chamberlain as that, and I suppose I'm biased because one of my closest friends in Britain is Winston Churchill's grandson. And we've gone over those years together over many a, a late evening conversation, almost as late and long as, as <laughs> some that I have in this country. But uh, uh, I would say that that revisionist line is partly true, that at least the British of Pisa's did understand the need to build up their defenses in case their strategy went wrong and they got a war. Robert Moss, along with Arno de Borchgrave, is author of The Spike. Just buy up every copy so it goes into paperback immediately. Let's get this book out across the country. Pass it around. Don't just wear an American flag and punch everybody in the nose who says something deprecating about our beloved country. Information, knowledge is power, and there's so much inside The Spike. Friends do not deny that their aim is global. Well, let's just take language for a minute. If I say the communists are out to conquer the world, if I were standing up in the high school auditorium and you were going to be the next speaker and I said, kids, I want to warn you, the communists are trying to conquer the world, you would wince in embarrassment for me. That would, because of the language, I mean, we all breathed the air of the so-called McCarthy era. That would just be gross. You couldn't buy that. If, on the other hand, we turn the page, and I'm now at the Harvard School of Foreign Service, and i got a beard and Phi Beta Kappa Key jangling on me, and I have a couple of books marked there, and if I stand up and say, I want to remind you, dear colleagues, that the Soviets' own concept of their destiny is global. You step off the train in Moscow, and greeting you is a big banner that says, forward to the victory of communism all over the world. They teach as a dogma that as long as one capitalist country remains, the world is not safe for the dictatorship of the proletariat. They will tell each other 
Detente, don't worry about it. It's simply a ruse, a device. They can't control their information as well as they did under Stalin. Stalin had an, a real iron curtain. It's more like a Venetian blind today. Right. And there's a meeting of Communist Party, Kadri, and Dnipro Petrovsk. People like you find out what was said. You told us a little bit earlier what was said at this meeting of the Warsaw Pact, okay, by Brezhnev. Anyhow, the Soviets make no bones about their concept of their system being globalized. So see, when I say globalized, that word has a necktie on it. You can see a glass of brandy alongside. We scholars understand what a global concept is. But when you stand up and say the communists are trying to conquer the world, that goes back to American comic books in 1940 with Mad Men and everything. Yeah, well, the trouble is we don't read what the Soviets themselves say. Even their published literature reiterates this theme. We are conned by our own words more than by theirs. You mentioned the word détente. And if you open up your French dictionary, your big Larousse dictionary, you find that one of the dictionary definitions of détente is the release of tension you get when you pull the trigger of a gun. No. That is détente no, in French. No, no, no. It's a French word, and I assume that the only definition we need accept is the French definition. Pulling the trigger of a gun. Something to do with that. That's certainly what the Soviets secretly mean by it. They have colonized our vocabulary to some extent, or maybe we've done it to ourselves out of our hope for a peaceful life and easy choices. You know, inertia is very strong in people and in societies. It's stronger than anything else. Much easier to do nothing than to do something when you're faced with a problem. And maybe that's why we haven't faced the hard choices we need to think about. The people I grew up with, I would love to hear what they say about me behind my back, although maybe I'd rather not, because except for me, I'm a singular exception insofar as I know, all the bright, young, eager, save-the-world journalists and, and people that I grew up with all wound up on the other side. They'd be listening right now, shaking their head about the neo-McCarthyism. I bet you there are essays being written right now. <laughs> the neo-McCarthyism is more dangerous. It is oleaginous. It is disguised with an intellectual veneer. Beware. The new McCarthyites are eels swimming through Vaseline. Uh, all right. They are all that way. And I'm now trying to put my head in my hands and say, how did it all begin? At no point, at no point were we invited to a secret spot in the country plied with beautiful women, whiskey, and flattered, uh, and then told us to pay attention to this guy from Moscow who wants to tell us some important things about the future of our country. At no point were we contacted. We did it all ourselves. I guess the one linchpin was ego. It was easy. It was automatic to believe uh, we are right, the Russians are wrong, uh, uh, shame on them, uh, up with the American flag, to set ourselves apart egoistically from the pack. We latched on to the first professor we heard who said, why, that is very simplistic. I mean, after all, we Ameri I mean, you know, we, we can't have a devil theory. There's no black and there's no white. Oh, ooh, ooh, that set us apart. And from that point forward, we just grew instinctively away from what the American people thought, because that, even before Archie Bunker, they were Archie Bunkers, you know what I mean? Right. And finally, you get up there uh, to where you you just find yourself automatically inventing the stuff yourself. Uh, whatever is intellectual, whatever is remote from the masses, whatever gives you the right to leer down uh, upon them, is uh, what... We started as, now at no point did any left winger that I know of ever go into an American newsroom with a machine gun and say, okay, I'm in charge here now, get away the typewriter's mind. They took over, new, these people I'm telling you about, yeah. took over newsrooms because they tended to be smarter, they were more talented, they felt that they were kissed by tongues of flame that rendered them especially sensitive to the needs and aspirations of all peoples. Yeah. And they wound up in the jobs manufacturing national opinion. All opinion in the English language. Right. Moscow didn't lift a finger. All they did was enjoy it. Well, Barry, Moscow's lifted a few fingers, but by and large, you're absolutely on the right track. I mean, the, 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 the worst factor operating here in the case of the media is simple, plain opportunism. Uh, one of my private laws, and I hope it's not absolutely true, is the law of life is that many journalists will sell their country for a headline. 
I'm afraid that although I'm glad that this is not universally true, but I can think of a few cases where it is true. And let's face it, it's much easier to get headlines by attacking the institutions of your own country than by looking at foreign institutions, foreign governments, foreign factors that may be subverting your society. It's been much easier to get plaudits by attacking the CIA than by attacking the KGB. Although I think everybody would have to agree, everybody who is rational, from the left, from the far left to the far right, unless they're Soviet agents, which there are relatively few, fortunately, everybody would need to agree that uh, the CIA is less of a threat to this country than the KGB. <laughs> this raises another question. It's much easier to attack the institutions of your own society than to attack those of the Soviet Union because you can't find a freedom of information suit in Moscow uh, and get the documents tumbling uh, out. Uh, uh, we'll be right. None of them could have believed it. The current Freedom of Information Act is the death of the defenses of a free society. I believe in open government. I believe in the accountability of government and all of that. But I also believe that liberty has to defend itself. Once it ceases to do that, it's lost. It's destroyed. And we are facing enemies who have none of our inhibitions. To any European, your Freedom of Information Act is a joke. It's laughable. It's surrealistic. The Polish Embassy files requests for inf confidential information under your Freedom of Information Act. Can you imagine how your European allies look at this? They wonder whether you're serious, whether you're for real. You are the leader of the Western Alliance. If you want to retain that status, you must reassure your allies that you can take account of your internal defense and our joint external defense more efficiently than you've done. The Freedom of Information Act is a joy for journalists. They can get secrets out of the CIA, they can get secrets out of anything. Fine, wonderful, I'm a journalist, I'm opportunistic too, I don't mind uh, using it myself to get information. But there are higher priorities at the end of the day than journalistic opportunism. One of them is that if we want to retain the freedoms that we cherish, we have to be pre prepared to pay the at least the minimum price of defending them. A former communist, uh, Steve Dedier, brother Vlado Dedier, was a close associate of Tito. Uh, I think Steve-O lives in Stockholm now. He wrote to 11 nations and asked for information on their intelligence gathering services, and the only one that even answered was the CIA, and they sent him a ton and a half of literature. Well, I'm afraid that when Europeans heard the CIA had appointed a press director for covert operations, uh, they collapsed in a fit of hysterics and haven't recovered since. Robert Moss, it took an act of Congress to make a countryman of yours, Winston Churchill, an honorary American. I want to cut through the red tape and appoint you right now, not only an honorary American, but a public utility, a national park, and one of our most treasured resources <laughs> for having written the spike. People who tune in uh, around the country will realize... Uh, uh, or should know, I think, the rules of the game. These are the three rules of the game tonight as I I dominate the show. In fact, I, I confess the only reason I wanted to control this show is merely to get in a few comments edgewise. I would happily uh, go one-on-one -on -one with you, but I feel this is, I'm, this is sort of the moral equivalent of taking you by the throat and saying, listen. <laughs> so the three rules of this game, Barry, are one, that there will be no North Carolina analogies. That is, uh, you will uh, fail to give us any uh, stories, roundabout uh, uh, historical haymakers from your youth. That's rule number one. <laughs> I presume that also includes South Carolina, Virginia, Georgia, Tennessee. Anything to do with the South. All right, so below Richmond is like below the belt. Absolutely. Okay. And there will be no what I call Alabanian uh, salience. That is uh, handy... Uh, historical references to the rape of East Europe, which uh, you often use to beat uh, uh, Russia on the head with. And, David? Okay. And No, I was just going to say, there goes the whole show. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And now you can see how easy it will be after I deprive Barry of these rhetorical tools he's been using all these years. And thirdly, Barry, I'd like to have you answer on a, merely on a need-to-know basis, okay? <laughs> that is, you will say nothing that we don't have to know uh, to understand the argument. I think I, we should tell our listeners that uh, I am certainly as far left of center as you are uh, right of center. However, the center is uh, sh shifted these days, I think, towards the right. But that I will, uh, I think, uh, 
disarm you immediately by saying that uh, I am not a liberal, I am not a Democrat, uh, and therefore uh, I will probably join you in uh, equal criticism of uh, those particular uh, pieces, portions uh, of the left, okay? And excerpts from a White House tape of Richard Nixon. And for any people out there who indeed b would like to believe that there is a shred of decency uh, to this politician, I offer them this. Uh, I will quote uh, Richard Nixon in a conversation he had in the Oval Office uh, in 1971 with Haldeman. And the conversation uh, begins like this. Th this is the president speaking, the president. On the Chicago 7, all Jews, Davis is a Jew, you know. Haldeman, I don't think Davis is the president. Hoffman, Hoffman, is it? Uh, Hoffman's a Jew. Haldeman, Abby Hoffman is, and, and that's so, president. John Luzon's a Lubin's uh, president. The other one they got, Haldeman, uh, whatever. Then the president says, about half of these are Jews. Haldeman, I think more now. That is uh, Richard Nixon, the president. I suppose, Barry, uh, you thought was going to bring us together in 1968 and 1972. As, as a Jew yourself, Barry, I wonder whether you can view Richard Nixon uh, with any sympathy after this anti-Semitism has been exposed in the paper. Uh, just to tease the listeners, may I first congratulate you in true Farber tradition. You have taken up the entire first segment of the show before anybody else has a chance or at least is invited to say anything. So you are following a noble tradition, and for that, I salute you. It took me many, many years to achieve that plateau, and here you come behind me, grab my blueprint, and apply it immediately, and I am proud. But I couldn't no. do it every night, though, Barry. Number two, number two, you have not yet exposed any anti-Semitism, and I will uh, return your serve uh, as soon as we reconvene after a short... Now, look, you got a good question going here. Note, folks, what has gone on. Let, let's just freeze this like time out and I don't think you can do Philip this in Nobile. my show, Barry. Look what, Philip, look what Philip Nobile has done. Here he reads a transcript, uh, put, dubbing in his own tone of voice. Uh, a conversation between Haldeman and Nixon, uh, where it's, isn't this one a Jew, the Chicago 7, aren't they all Jews? Well, I don't think this one is. Yeah, well, this one is, this one is a Jew, Jew, Jew. And then, in front of an audience uh, of uh, many, uh, you, you say serious Jews, I'll say uh, devout Jews of all the Jewish persuasions, Orthodox, conservative, reform, etc. Before an audience of that, I, who not only am a Jew, but am, am an open Jew, am now challenged to say something redeeming. I am dared not to join the condemnation of Richard Nixon after we hear through the words of interpreter Philip Nobile. That's just what I said exactly about five minutes ago. And now we're waiting for your answer. Office. Fine. Nothing you have read so far is anti-Semitic. If somebody is taking tapes on me in my office, they will hear things that can be twisted uh, into sounding vastly more anti-Semitic, anti-black, and since I'm denied the chance to use my beautiful Albanians, I'll say anti-Romanian, vastly more. When grown-ups get together and discuss serious matters, you want to know things. When you are saying things not for publication, but into a tape recorder that uh, not everybody in the room knows is there, and you're talking freely and unselfconsciously, it's a matter of interest. Hey, wait a minute. Are, are they Jewish? How many are they half Jewish? Okay, Barry, that's, that's the nicest phased, interpretation, you Barry. You haven't phased me at all. The, oh, I, my concern is resupply to Israel. Uh, the pres any president of the United States has my permission uh, to ask who is a Jew, who is not a Jew, how many are Jews. He is free to be vastly more anti-Semitic in his words, and you have quoted Mr. Nixon as being, let him resupply Israel immediately okay. after the Arab attack the way Nixon did in October 1973, Barry. and I will say yes, this man does have more than a shred of decency. Okay, then. So there have been other charges of his, of his anti semitism Rather have a Richard Nixon who says things that you fear are anti-Semitic in the Oval Office and resupplies Israel than a Jimmy Carter who pretends to love Jews and all of a sudden gets rhapsodic about a Palestinian homeland. Barry. Barry. Bill, certainly we can infer that a non-Jewish president and a non-Jewish Haldeman probably had that country club glint 
uh, in their voices, in their hearts. And you know something? I, as not just a serious Jew, but as a proud Jew, couldn't care less. Give me my America. Give me my constitutional freedoms. Give me a president okay. who is on Israel's but side. Gary, as a Jew, on Israel's side, as Nixon proved repeatedly, he was. But listen, you can be pro-Israel and still anti-Semite. The, you know? then, then that's, that's not, that's not difficult at we all. We need more anti-Semites like that. All right, but Barry, how that's is the crux. And you are indeed more to the left uh, of center than I am to the right, or just as much. And worse than that, you are old-fashioned in your concepts of bigotry and brotherhood. To you, a person who is caught on a tape saying, isn't he a Jew, 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 that's anti-Semitic and we're all supposed to take a pill and lie down, whereas somebody who gets up and says, and our great friends, the Jewish people, ooh, they're marvelous. It is not, pal, what you say about another people. It is not how you feel about another people. Here comes the punchline. Listen closely. It is what you do because of how you feel about that people. And if you don't believe it, ask our dear friends, the blacks. Uh, ask the Italians, ask the Irish. It is not what you harbor in your heart about another people. It's what you do because of what you harbor in your heart. And I dare you to show me an action that Richard Nixon made against the Jews or against the state of Israel. Barry, you don't have to uh, do anything against the state of Israel uh, to prove your anti-Semitic then, then credential. About, then against the Jews. Wait a minute. And you don't have to do anything against Jews to justify or to prove your anti-Semitic credentials so again. So we've got your... But you can be a conceptual anti-Semite. You can hate Jews. You can hate Negroes. You can hate anyone without anyone in the world ever knowing it. Well, fine, I'm wait, saying Richard me. Nixon is exposed fine. here as, a conceptual as an anti-Semite. And what amazes me is you, as a Jew, are not offended. Not at you all. are looking not to not save Richard Nixon. Less. No, I'll tell That's you one word. Not only am I not offended, but I'll tell you what I'm going to do. As I enter the confines of my synagogue on the upcoming High Holy Days, I will pray to God that a larger and larger and larger percentage of anti-Semites in the world become conceptual anti-Semites instead of actual anti-Semites, murderous anti-Semites, exterminating anti-Semites. Send us more conceptual anti-Semites, please. Very Particularly those who resupply Israel when they're attacked. If Clay and I use it, it's uh, If you can name, look, you know, you remind me of a girlfriend I used to have. Name one case. Uh, we don't have to go any further than this case. I think anyone, uh, me, beg you never to eavesdrop on me. Because there is not a bigoted corpuscle in my bloodstream, and I will tell filthy ethnic jokes in my office among my friends, with the people I'm working with, occasionally with members of the other race or creed or color or ethnic group. I am unafraid in this free country to stand up and banter and joke and josh and kid and tease and have fun, because it is all done in a spirit of good, clean fun. And for you to pretend to know the tone of voice between Nixon and Haldeman, and I'm not even going to fight you on that. I give it to you. Pretend that it was country, pretend it was conceptual anti-Semitism. I say again, give me more conceptual anti-Semites that will resupply Israel instantaneously upon attack. Uh, Roy Cohn, for you people who may forget, is a uh, aging McCarthyite uh, who uh, has uh, achieved some degree of fame here since he assisted uh, Senator McCarthy in purging America of uh, the Red Menace. And uh, I, I consider this a very... Forgive me, uh, people in the control room are busy answering phones. I don't think anybody noticed that was a personal attack and must be logged as such before the FCC. What, what, Go what ahead. did I say? Well, thought about your concern for Russia. And I said to myself, Barry's an intelligent man, uh, politically engaged, uh, has kind of a uh, obsession about Russia's affair in, in this world. And I would like to think of myself as also intelligent, politically engaged, and yet I, I, I can't get aroused, uh, as Barry does constantly, about Russia. And one of the, the things I think of when, when we think of the great East-West battle, uh, which may end the world someday, I think of how... I, I've never met a Russian. Uh, to me, uh, they're a totally abstract enemy. Uh, in fact, 99% uh, of Americans have never met Russians, and the same is true of Russians of Americans. Yet because there is this 1% military-industrial complex on both sides who uh, obviously get off in uh, uh, military uh, challenges and military preparations and murmurs of battle and surrogate wars around the world, I'm thinking, isn't it crazy 
that Farah, you and I, and David, may be vaporized someday because, let's say, 1%, uh, maybe a, a fraction of 1% of this uh, of American population uh, are in battle with a fraction of 1% of the Russians. And yet, you, Barry, uh, applaud uh, the arms race. Uh, you applaud America's rearmament. You applaud, I presume, the Reagan defense budget. Uh, because this, I think, satisfies a kind of uh, uh, satisfaction for your uh, Tumescent conservatism. And I was thinking, obviously, arming is not the way out. Uh, building up the arsenal is not the way out. Eventually, if we're going to live with the Russians in this world, in fact, if this world is going to survive, I would think the idols in, in this world would be men of peace who are looking, in fact, for that... Uh, that uh, discarded concept of detente and arms limitation. Barry, why are you not for arms limitation? First of all, I can't wait for I am for that, not because of my tumescent conservatism, but because of my tumescent survivalism. I am grateful that people in the 1940s did not say, look, I never met a German. There are some abstract enemy to me. The whole objective, you see, of turning America from sea to shining sea to, uh, into a war machine was to keep us from meeting Germans. And if we had not armed and gotten stronger than Hitler, I'd be a lampshade and you'd be speaking German right now with an authentic sounding accent. Yes, I'm very much in favor of arming getting strong. I guess I believe in what General Eisenhower said. Unpreparedness for war is almost as criminal as war itself. Do you believe that uh, the arms race makes the world safer? Absolutely. Absolutely. Will you show me one example? One example in the history of mankind where an aggressor was stopped other than by force or threat of force. Could I, could I say this? I think the old... When, when people say that to me, I say, of course I'd rather be red than dead. And in fact, uh, some of our greatest heroes, and your heroes, are red rather than dead. No. Lech Walesa is red rather than dead. That is... And that may change. Of course that may change, but only because he's alive. For example, uh, I certainly would prefer to surrender to Russian domination rather than risk nuclear no. war. No. Because that's no. so no. interesting. I would... All like pots, not at all like acid. It's not at all like hash. Uh, cocaine, they say, clarifies. I don't know. I've never taken cocaine, but I've taken Sobrin, Joe Sobrin, in column form, in handshake form, in stand up after dinner and speak form. And I can tell you that he clarifies too. And I'm grateful to Bob Martin for turning me on uh, to Joe. Sobern, who is an editor of National Review. His column breaks like champagne across the pages of the New York Post and other papers across the nation. You've heard his voice on CBS's noble rainbow of American political opinion called Spectrum. Welcome. Barry, thank you very much. That's overwhelming. Well, we don't have official guests of honor, but uh, I like to let each guest know how I feel up front. Uh, Robert, let me... Um, find out how you got turned on to Joe Sobern and how you would uh, try to turn other listeners than Barry Farber on. Well, uh, I've been an avid reader of National Review for many years, and that was my first introduction to Joe Sobern. And uh, recently, I'd say over the past year or so, he's been a syndicated columnist for some time at the Los Angeles Syndicate. Uh, recently, uh, again, about the past year, he's been appearing in the New York Post, and uh, those columns have been a, a great treat for me to read. And I'm sure to many of the, the New Yorkers uh, who have our, of our political persuasion and otherwise possesses a uh, philosophical bent that I think eludes most uh, uh, most reporters, reporter uh, type of uh, columnists. Where does Joe Sobern most like to hit Bob Martin? Is it through the economy, uh, uh, foreign policy, uh, the erosion of traditional American values? I think uh, his strength. Uh, would be in the area of uh, analyzing liberalism in all its manifestations, political, social, intellectual, psychological, moral, uh, also uh, the, the, the media, uh, and again, how that uh, interacts with uh, liberalism. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, he has developed a, a theory, would you call it, or a uh, I'd say a, a metaphor. A metaphor, okay. It's a, it's a way of gathering up a lot of 
data and seeing them in a pattern. Uh, the, the hive is my image. The, uh, I call it hive theory, jokingly, but it's, uh, it's actually a, a metaphor, as I say. You mean the bee or the allergy? The beehive. Oh. <laughs> the, I, I like to compare the uh, predominant political culture of our time to a beehive in which there are different kinds of bees, some of whom call themselves liberals, some of whom call themselves social democrats or socialists, some of whom call themselves Marxist, communist, whatever. And they, uh, they, they swarm in certain patterns. It's not a conspiracy theory, it's the opposite. The conspiracy theory imputes conscious purpose to all of it. I think it's a kind of instinct that uh, possesses people. It's kind of programmed into them in education and through the media in all sorts of ways. It's a, it's a whole culture they're not even conscious of imbibing. But it does operate to, to make them um, s sort of spontaneously form into uh, uh, certain patterns and uh, work together for certain ends. I the think in the jargon of the hunt. Drones, workers, queens, and they, uh, but they, no don't, kings. they don't attack each other. For instance, the liberal is much more likely to attack an anti-communist than a communist. That doesn't mean the liberals are in cahoots with communists at all. It's just that they somehow don't like to see communists attack from the right. They don't like the Soviet Union. It's, in fact, the Soviet Union is a great embarrassment to anyone who holds out hope for the state uh, creating this glowing new society. At one time, it was possible to hope for that from the Soviet Union. And then, of course, the, there were... China and Cuba and the new Vietnam, I remember Anthony Lewis applauding almost the forced march of three million Cambodians out of Phnom Penh. Uh, and his, his justification for this was that they were pursuing their, quote, vision of a new society. This is the man who calls Jerry Falwell dangerous. Mm -hmm. now, uh, it's, 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 it's quite typical for, for people like that, uh, without giving it much thought, I think, to... to uh, speak very soothingly of the latest utopian, but to speak in dire accents. Have you ever found that it's a, it's a modern faith, you know, the, the idea that with a rational leadership or elite, you can create a new society. It's hugely arrogant. You can only do it by force. Uh, a new society just doesn't occur. I mean, we have traditions and habits and all sorts of things. And when you try to destroy the past, you, you wind up with a very grisly future. You may remember, you know, Lincoln Steffens coming back from the Soviet Union and saying, I've been over into the future and it works. Well, we've heard people say that about uh, China in the last few years. Uh, they've almost run out of utopias now. And yet, anybody brilliant enough to come up with the hive theory, which gives liberals red welts, uh, will be smart enough to help me out of this dilemma. What kind of a theory am I groping for now? You heard my in fable David Schulte talking about the Soviet Union blowing the act in Afghanistan, 1979, late 79, actually 1980. Now, my biggest quarrels with my best Jewish friends are the ones who gave up on the United Nations when they denounced Zionism as racist. Where were they during the years of, uh, at best, inactivity, uh, at worst, uh, uh, outright a condonation of evil uh, inside the halls of the United Nations. In other words, why do we need Afghanistan? Why didn't the Soviet Union blow it by acquiring Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia in 1940 by virtue of a pact with the late Adolf Hitler? Why didn't they blow it by enslaving Eastern Europe, imposing an iron curtain, strangulating Berlin? I'm not even up to 1947 yet. Uh, I say never believe a theory unless uh, it's supported by a fact, but even more important, never believe a fact unless it's supported by a theory. Uh, when we get back together, the World War II interview. During World War II, there was no television, there was network radio, and, and every single show, regardless of whether it was a variety show or a big-name band, they were always sponsored by a cigarette, invariably. Uh, they would interrupt whatever they were doing, and they would bring in war heroes just for interviews. They were really implants, not interviews. They had no relation to the format, the purview, the purpose of the show, but it just made everybody feel good to interview a war hero once in a while. And they were different heroes every time, but the same interview. Tell us about it. Well, 
I didn't notice the first three bullets uh, through my wrist, arm, uh, and ankle. The grenade went off. I felt the fragmentation coming off the uh, and a mortar shot landed close by, and the concussion knocked me dizzy, and the fragments turned track. I feel my pelvis was dripping all over. So I was blood to know I was literally alive or dead. By. And then a couple more rats at that machine gun, small arm, five in the shoulders, chest, and neck area. And then they shot my buddy, and then I got mad. Uh, yeah, that, 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 that's the way they all went. And, and that strikes me as the way a lot of people are uh, reacting now to the Soviet Union. Afghanistan, indeed. Welcome to 1979-1980. Where has the world been when the Soviet Union has compounded felonies and villainies uh, since the very well, since the beginning of the Soviet Union? But to raise the curtain on relevance, certainly uh, since the day World War II ended and we had a chance to unfasten our seatbelts and contemplate no longer Nazi Germany, no longer uh, warmongering Japan, but the Soviet Union. Well, Barry, I think you hit it right on the head. You say every fact has to have a theory. And the, uh, the thing is that people can discount enormous numbers of facts if they have the wrong theory guiding them all the time. They, they wear these kind of blinders. And so we've always been told that the threat is something else. There's a threat of nuclear war, but there's not a Soviet threat. Uh, I've never been able to figure that out. Of course, the... the the Soviet threat is the one we're all at least subliminally worried about. People know it's there. It's the uh, return of the repressed, in a way. They, 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 they know they should be indignant about it, but their indignation comes out against some other target because they're afraid to, to attack the Soviet Union. They'll attack the Springboks. They'll attack Reagan. This business about warmonger, this business about being um, provocative, favorite word of both the Soviets and the liberals, by a kind of uh, uh, unconscious linkage there, I think. They, 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 there's this feeling that the Soviet Union is the ultimate power in the world, and it's like the death god, Moloch, you know, it has to be propitiated, appeased all the time. You can't provoke that angry god. If, uh, if people don't believe in anything higher than that, then death becomes the ultimate reality, and whoever can threaten you with death becomes, in an operative sense, your god. So the Soviet Union... Uh, must not be confronted. We must avoid confrontation. We always hear this. And it's not only physical confrontation. We, we avoid then moral confrontation. If we denounce them, then we're committed to doing something about them at some point. People are very afraid of that, understandably. But the, if only they would just frankly admit they're afraid instead of trying to dress it up in this pseudo-moral language. Mm. I'd like to show the oath first. We are going through some soul searching in talk radio. I'll tell you why. The confrontations don't get it like they used to. Now, I never did confrontations so as to draw crowds. I did confrontations because they were all long overdue, and when I came along, everything was stacked up on the left, and we were helpless, tolerated little freaks who believed differently from the prevailing wisdom. The, the, the batch of columns that uh, Bob Martin gave me by you, Joe, uh, that helped me get acquainted with your brilliance, were in uh, two, two or three cases about that liberal wisdom and that liberal overlay. I'm thinking of your column now about the difference between, uh, what is it, public, public opinion, opinion and popular and sentiment. Popular sentiment. Yes. Right. Ooh, wow. Two, two the people that look suspiciously like cousins. Some people think they're Siamese twins. Yeah. They are space aliens, one from yeah. the other, uh, in many cases. Anyhow, I never did. I mean, if I'd wanted to please crowds, I'd have gone into sex early and stayed there uh, and never had any trouble drawing crowds. But the confrontation, the, uh, the, the raising of tempers doesn't do it like it used to. I know it doesn't. We don't need any index except the fact that we can just sort of tell. You can tell when you hit a golf ball. You can tell by the click. You don't have to uh, see the videotape as to where the ball is rolling, and we do the same thing on the air here. And I use an old word called zeitgeist, one of my words I did not learn from Bill Buckley. I learned it from my German teacher, zeitgeist, marvelous, the spirit of the times. It does change, and it doesn't take all that many years to change. You would not have uh, wowed the crowd uh, if you had gotten up on stage and belted out, won't you come home, Bill Bailey? Uh, at Woodstock in 1968, right? Would you, Bob? No, not exactly. Uh, I mean, if I'd like... Right. Now, 
The popular wisdom is confrontation, left versus right, no sense anymore. That battle is over. Uh, you can't keep on winning World War II. Uh, if you march too long through the Arch de Triomphe, you'll get bunions, uh, and now we're into something else. Question. Is that true? And if so, what's the something else? Is it mortgages? Uh, is it home repair? Is it how to grow radish sprouts? And well, I really think the left, uh, the intelligentsia of the left, uh, have dissipated so, so greatly. Uh, when I read uh, Lewis and Wicker and these guys, they spend all of their time attacking conservatives, attacking Reagan. They don't offer any constructive uh, policy or ideas. There's nothing there. Uh, Joe is an example of uh, what we've discussed many times about how uh, with the Reagan revolution, uh, the whole thrust of, uh, uh, of creativity, uh, intellectual political creativity, is on the right. And Joe's an example of that. There are no Joe Soberns of the left. They don't exist. Uh, I, I go out of my way to, to read uh, all the, the, the left-wing, quote-unquote, uh, magazines like the progressive, the nation, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't find them. I just don't find, I don't find a new idea anywhere. Well, they, I, I think what's happened is that liberalism, uh, well, at one time it was very creative, and let's not overlook the achievements it really did offer and, and the good motives of, of uh, so many liberals. I mean, they were, really were compassionate in all sorts of ways, and a lot of what they achieved is here to stay in the area of civil rights, for instance. The, uh, the, trouble, the trouble is that liberalism has been sucked into the orbit of socialism, and the, the, uh, it's, it's exhausted. It has nothing new to add. It's made its contribution, essentially, and everything new... Gee, thanks. <laughs> well, everything, everything new it, uh, is simply more bizarre than what went before. So... Uh, uh, also, the, this business of public opinion and popular sentiment, that's a distinction that the historian uh, John Lukash makes, is very important because it was a matter of good manners and decorum to be liberal for a long time. It got very artificial. It's like the Victorian age. It was a great age. We speak condescendingly now of the Victorians as if they were a bunch of fools, but they weren't. But they... At some point, the Victorian etiquette became so brittle, so artificial, that it just didn't have anything to do with reality. And lots of things started breaking through, and the, the old code was overturned. I think yes. this happens perennially, and we're seeing something like that now. Uh, David was speaking about Afghanistan and all of these outrageous events of the past year that have uh, changed people to more of an anti-Soviet stance. But I think that this, the, if we talk about uh, uh, popular sentiment, as opposed mm -hmm. to public opinion, public opinion being the media, etc. I, I like to define it as what everyone thinks everyone else thinks. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, I can go that far, Bob. I think the, the, uh, the race is always there. It's always a motive, it's always a source of tension, and it's not one that is talked about in public very much, except, you know, to blame whites, which is just unrealistic and unfair. Now, on the other hand, to talk as if it were all the fault of blacks is unrealistic and unfair, too, of course. We've had that probably overemphasized in such a way as to uh, suggest that whites are all to blame for it. The problem is not whites and not blacks, but crime. The, in fact, the, the real poverty problem in this country isn't food, it's safety. I, I've thought this for a long time. What is it? <laughs> My, uh, I was just stunned, you know, when I was in Europe with this euphoric relief of not having to worry about being out alone at night. Now, I mean, I'm used to New York and Washington and other big cities I've, I spend uh, a lot of time in, great cities, and yet they're just not civilized in the basic sense. I mean, the whole point of civil society is to keep people safe. I can get out of it. There are lots of people who are just stuck in these cities all the time. I was going to say the real problem of poverty in this country it's not starvation. Uh, the, the, uh, we don't find famished beggars in the streets. The real problem of poverty is that it, safety now costs you money. If you can afford good real estate, you get safety. It's not a right. It's not a secured right that everyone can count on. And so you get not just old people and, and kids, but uh, anyone who can't afford to, uh, to leave the city uh, has to worry night and day, especially night, of course, about uh, getting mugged or robbed or raped. And it's just a terrible, 
comment on, on what we've become that this uh, hasn't even been a subject of discussion. We just take it for granted that the streets belong to the criminals at certain hours. The, um, uh, well, there is a, the first of human rights, the right to be safe from personal assault, unenforced. We talk about all sorts of other rights. We pull rights out of hats. We invent rights. We've got civil rights and civil liberties and gay rights and women's rights and children's rights and all sorts of other rights and entitlements. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're, somebody else is going to uh, uh, subsidize all sorts of rights you haven't yet dreamed of. But don't ask about that right. That's well, proportion. The, the more inessential things the government does, the worse it will do the essential things. Mm -hmm. The essential thing is to protect the citizen, both from foreign attack and from domestic violence. If I, if I chose I, Sobrin's columns, um, he pointed out that we, uh, we uh, liberal and conservative, have lived at the bottom of a liberal ocean for so long. Joe Sobrin said it a lot better. We, we don't realize how much we inhale of the other fumes. I think a lot of people who feel exactly the way you feel, David, which is obviously the only decent way to feel, uh, have been muted, have been not intimidated, but almost subconsciously unplugged from making heavy weather of it because we have breathed the fumes that the liberals emitted and somehow they convinced us that it was bad taste to dwell over long on this particular... Yes, thing. the idea was that if we, if we spent enough money on social programs and got at the course, root causes of crime, it would just evaporate. Well, we knew that wasn't going to happen, and yet we also felt that it was futile to say anything because, we, first of all, we'd be attacked as racist, fascist, what have you. Uh, the, the, uh, you. You know, you really don't say things. Speech is a form of action, and you don't even talk unless you think it's going to have some uh, positive consequences. So there are subjects you just don't bring up just out of this sense of futility. I think you're quite right. We should talk about it because it's astounding the way popular sentiment does come forth and become public opinion once somebody addresses these problems rationally. Now, every six months or so when a beetle or a president is shot, you know, I, I do uh, a few columns and commentaries on the subject, but then it seems to fade away and we wind up talking about budget cuts and things. And yes, not, not we must get at the root causes. Sweden has won its war on poverty. I mean, they won. Poverty gave up. There's no poverty in Sweden, but there's a great deal of crime, and it's growing. Thing in the middle, in between the prosecution and the defendant at Fidel Castro's first kangaroo trial, it was in a circus tent, appropriately enough, which had not yet been taken down. A circus came to town. Batista fled. Castro took over. The animals were still right where the owners left them, grazing right, right outside the circus tent, and that's where they tried Major Jesus Sosa Blanco. One of Batista's, uh, I am sure, uh, guilty as accused, uh, more savage lieutenants in eastern Cuba. Anyhow, my point is that I remember sitting looking at that tribunal. We were all for Castro in those days, palpitatingly for Castro. When I say we, I mean the press. Because everybody, everybody. I don't know anybody who was not for I do not know anybody who was not for Fidel Castro. I'll tell you, the first person I ever heard say I'm not for Fidel out loud that was very soon after he took over, Victor Lasky. Um, I, I remember looking at the military tribunal, bearded, wise men, uh, hearing the testimony. And I remember saying, these people are not like I am. By golly, if I were part of a movement that overthrew a dictator and liberated a country, I'd be so happy that 100% of the people were now on my side and, and, and the Batista police and the aren't. There was no longer, we were free, free, free at last. And I wouldn't convene these wretched trials and firing squads. I'd let these poor discredited wretches roam and get jobs cutting sugar cane. Or as long as they kept out of positions of power and didn't do any more harm, I'd be very forgiving. I don't know whether it's my religion or whether I'm from another planet or, or what. But I'm about to convene right now, against my better judgment, a sort of a an intellectual war crimes trial, or, or shall we say that we're we're now a committee of four: columnist, broadcaster Joseph Sobrin, and I mean turns tired blood into sparkling burgundy with very few words in his columns, and on the CBS national radio feature Spectrum. Uh, and a little bit later on in the broadcast, I want you to consider this: Do we, in myopic 
Barry Farber fashion, simply let the liberals off the hook and say, nice try, fellas, and he really held sway for 35 years. Obviously, being America, we don't have genuine war crimes trials, but I bet you there's going to be some stupid liberal who's going to take me literally. Do you know, once I, once I was talking, David, you know that, that, that riff I, I get into once in a while about me, whenever I see somebody who is not taking care of his body, I feel a Paris Island sergeant's lust. Uh, I want to line him up and, and, and tell him that if I don't see the, that 15 pounds off of his chart by Wednesday after next, ooh, 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 we're going to send him to a little island we just bought off Venezuela where there are very few calories. Uh, a communist newspaper said, Mr. Farber, who confesses to fascist tendencies. Uh, I was obviously kidding. It was, you know, folk allegory. Amen. Not to embarrass them not to uh, uh, argue with them at dinner parties, not to try to take their women away from them on dance floors or on crowded beaches or wherever. No, I, I, think, I think the fair retribution is it, it shall be considered fair to brandish their words before the public every now and then, particularly if, when, and as they again seek political office. Mm -hmm. that, that was well, Nelson's absolutely. theory. Mentioning the four quotes of the four people that Nelson uh, quoted by saying, Here, here's the kind of stuff I mean, Barry. Why don't you remind them that during the Vietnam War, this major figure said this, uh, who ran mm -hmm. within the past year and a half, and that this major figure who may run within the next year and a half said this, and so forth on down. I think that's the proper, the proper punishment for being wrong, is merely that in a free society you are vulnerable to being re-quoted. <laughs> yes. Found that there is still the establishment. In fact, the, one of the great techniques of uh, liberals in general is to pretend they're the outsiders, the adversaries, and, and so on. In fact, I think most of them in their souls have never believed they were the status quo. They think they're always against the status quo. And uh, Bob was mentioning a while ago, uh, off mic, the, uh, uh, the, this big media campaign now against Reagan. It really is incredible. I mean, they're really turning up the firepower in the institutions they still hold. There was uh, the Yale... President Bartlett Jamadi's hysterical attack against the moral majority the other day. He called them racist, violent, coercive. It was his equivalent of Joe McCarthy's wheeling speech. He's, he made all these unfounded allegations against them. Did the media press him? Did they ask him to, to give details, to name names and dates and so on? Not a bit. They carried the speech straight, just reported it as if they were passing on the words of the Delphic Oracle. And they... they uh, let him get away with it. The, well, uh, that speaks this this uh, culture I was talking about. Well, why aren't the, uh, the things like this? Uh, the the media pride themselves on you know this adversary posture, but they're adversary against conservatism, adversary against what they perceive as conservatism, against Nixon, against Carter, insofar as he was not the complete liberal. They're not adversary against the bureaucracy. They don't expose. Uh, well, crime, for one thing, they don't they don't give that the attention it deserves. It's in the back pages of the New York Times. The uh, uh, they don't expose Tip O'Neill. I mean, this they're, they're not critical of the liberal programs. Uh, when you in, that the liberal program itself deserves criticism. Oh, I see. Instead, they've been exposing capitalism. They they've, they've been supporting Ralph Nader all the way. They've taken that ideology for granted. They think of this as an adversary posture, even when those programs become the establishment. I would have Wall Street Journal, which is very conservative editorially, but its reporters are not. They, well, uh, I don't think that uh, editors have all that much control simply because these are very pervasive attitudes, and reporters, to a great extent, have freedom. I think the artistic community, uh, entertainment community, and the press uh, have reinforced this negative image of the police. They hate the police. I efforts. Yeah, and great who effort. Allegedly stabbed... Uh, stabbed a man to death. He was just arrested after fleeing from the police for a month. Here's the glorification of violence. This is not a case, you understand, where Mailer thought the man had been wrongly imprisoned and, and uh, fought to get him out. There, there was this romantic, romanticization of violence by the guy himself and, of course, by Mailer. He's been writing this way for years. Yes, and also the idea that our prison system, they, they compare it to the gulag. In fact, Abbott said it's worse than the gulag. Can you imagine? A Utah prison.
And uh, there's this, this, this hatred of the normal somehow that you find so strong among so many intellectuals. And they blame everything on us. You know, if, the, if there's poverty in the third world, it's our fault. If there's violence in the streets, it's our fault. Everything is our fault. It's reverse mm -hmm. super patriotism. The, you know, the old super patriotism held that we were the, the, the uh, fountain of all good things on earth. Now we seem to be the fountain of all bad things. It's a, it's a kind of egomania. But, but, but what's absurd is uh, the New York Times book review a couple weeks ago, their whole front page was devoted to Abbott. Uh, there was a, an interview of Abbott and there was a, a review of his book. And obviously there was no mention of the fact that he was a fugitive from justice, which to me is outrageous. And uh, it, again, the glorification. Uh, Abbott had a huge party given to him by Mailer and uh, Scott Meredith, his uh, agent, and the publisher uh, down in the village. Big party. He's a big celebrity, this guy. Uh, where you can go in... Well, it's a, it's a posture, I think, to, to a great extent. It's a luxury. I mean, you know, there's a big difference uh, among the newspapers in New York. The, uh, the New York Times, the, the sort of Bureau of Standards for Liberal Opinion, can, well, it's read by people who uh, live in apartment, nice apartments in nice neighborhoods. They have doormen, they take the taxi. They don't have to ride the subways. They don't have to worry about crime. They're insulated from yeah, crime. Yeah, but those people are not... There's still a different class of people, really. They're the kind of people who can afford to look with this Olympian detachment on victim and and criminal and say, well, who's really to blame? We're all guilty. That was their line on, on this Abbott. That was the editorial line of the New York Times. We all bear some responsibility. Well, we do, but not in the sense yeah. they mean it. Child like Sam Levinson used to before he went on to Ed Sullivan show. I can do that whole argument. I used to, it, took, it took 20 years. I can do it in 20 seconds. The liberal says, wait a minute. We do not control the media there. Said there's a thousand, there's a thousand radios, and only a small percentage are what you would call liberal. And whereupon we end the argument by saying, sure, pal. But put your Gaffney, South Carolina Gazettes and your Sherall Tribunes and your Yadkinville Picayunes uh, into a glove compartment. Uh, the power media, great on points, okay, like in heavyweight fights. Uh, weigh it. Uh, where do, uh, is the clout media, the New York Times, the major networks, the weekly news magazine, is your clout media over here or over there? And that's the end of that argument. It took me a little longer than 20 seconds, but that's the way it goes. So we're beyond arguing if, we're arguing why and how. It's pushed in uh, in universities. It's it's very popular with intellectuals. They always think of themselves as uh, being uh, at the levers in this new society. And lots of people think of themselves as intellectuals, too. And so we, we, we've had mass higher education publicly subsidized with certain values carefully excluded methodically. Uh, religion, traditional values. It's unconstitutional to teach them in school from, you know, the grade grade school level up now, so that uh, the, the cards are stacked in favor of liberalism and socialism in all sorts of ways. I mean, that's that's one sort of explanation. And so the, the, there didn't have to, to be uh, any kind of compulsion used. There were, there were more carrots than sticks by far. Lots of rewards handed to people, too, and lots of incentives of other kinds. I mean, the idea of sexual freedom, uh, very popular. You know, the idea that, that you can have sex without any kind of personal commitment or consequences. Oh, that's a, you know, that's a great selling point. And uh, all, all these things were mixed in together in all sorts of ways. Since there are, by house fiat, no liberals present right now, and don't you write me a nasty letter because I'll write you a nasty one. Where were you the 35 years when there never was a conservative there? We do our share of confrontation. We do our share of investigation, sometimes with only the other side. I think it's a higher standard uh, of broadcasting. Gentlemen, do you believe the liberals were most right and what I will take the liberty of calling we, since we seem to have a consensus, uh, were most wrong over the past 35 years. Joe Sobrin. Well, in 1964, I was a liberal. I was only 18. It was a youthful flirtation. But I'll tell you, in those days, the liberals really had their great issue, and that was civil rights. And I think that they were, on the whole, the right side. In those days, remember... They were denouncing the double standard. I mean, we've now got the double standard in a pseudo-benign form. But in those days, they had uh, a clear moral consensus behind them. 
um, it was it was very stirring. The March on Washington, the Civil Rights Act of '64, which I disapprove of in some respects, but still it was morally uh, on the right side, and it was so compelling. Conservatives really got left out on that, and it was their own fault. The greatest area where the liberals were right and that our side was wrong is in the nature of monolithic communism. Now, I, I still will not respect them for the way they use the argument. They use it as an excuse for unilateral disarmament and shame on us for trying to, to build a strong military and etc. However, I think they're right in one thing. I will confess to having grown up with the notion that if a Marxist government takes over territory, then it becomes gray, which it does. It becomes dictatorial, which it does. But I always assumed it became one more finger in the Soviet's clenched fist, which it, of course, obviously does not. The trouble is that they can do in so many places what they have done in Cuba, and that is to provide what Richard Nixon calls the, the kind of foreign policy, other side, the kind of foreign aid that uh, a lot of these dictators want most. They want an infrastructure. They want power, they, and they invite the Soviets in to help them consolidate it. But the Soviets established their own infrastructure there. And then, I mean, if, Castro cannot defy the Soviets. Uh, maybe this is an...